Amen. Before we start tonight, let me just now give you one last announcement. We are having a Louisiana flood relief and uh, donations uh, at this church. Let me just tell you what's going to happen, when and where. The donation station is located at the center right rear entrance, uh, and it's designated by signs and drop-off times. You can bring things to the church from Monday to Friday, uh, and uh, from 9 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., and then uh, Saturday and Sunday from 9 a.m. to 12. Here's what they're collecting only. Uh, water and Gatorade. They're going to send this all down to Louisiana, so please, if you can participate. Individually wrapped snacks, crackers and chips, nuts or trail mix, and beef jerky. Diapers, all sizes, wipes, baby formula, Similac, uh, juice packs, insect repellent, large heavy-duty garbage bags, and flashlights with batteries. So donated items will benefit all the families that are affected by the flooding in Louisiana. How many believe the church needs to step up and do something like that? So make sure that you become a participant of that. Pastor Justin is in the back. If you want any more information, just see him after service. All right, let's go to Islam. Islam exposed. Let me just tell you something, and let me start off by telling you this. As we've been telling you, this goes onto the internet, and Brian has told me that on YouTube, Brian has told me that this is the most watched, and we have a whole lot of people that watch it. Several hundred thousand have watched Mark Carell ministry videos uh, around the world, about 190 nations, and uh, we know that this one is far surpassing anything else we've ever taught. So obviously people in the internet, people on YouTube want to know this. It's going everywhere. And yes, we're getting all kinds of emails from it. Don't even ask. But what we want to tell you is we want to give you the facts so that you are well equipped to understand. It's called apologetics. Apologetics means this. Why do you believe what you believe? And why do you believe what you believe as opposed to what somebody else believes? Apologetics isn't saying you're sorry for something. It's saying the reason why you believe something. It's your fundamental statement. So in order to re realize that Christianity is what it is, we know Christianity, you have got to know what the other religions are about. Now, there's a lot of religions out there. You can't know every one of them. But you can know the major religions on the planet. And the major religions the three monotheistic religions on the planet. Actually, Judaism isn't even a major religion. It's 0.03% of the planet's population. But Islam is very, very big in the planet, quickly growing. So let me just give you a little bit of a review. I think there was a whole lot of information last week. How many would say amen? And how many would say I caught like a little bit of it after you said open your Bibles? And so let me give you a little bit more information so you can go on and just review a little bit so you know. What does Islam mean? It's the Arabic word that uh, means submission. And it derives from a word meaning peace. Don't be confused by that word peace because it's peace at any cost. If somebody doesn't want to willingly submit, Islam says you get them to submit. You get them to have a peace without going against you by doing something that would go against them. In a religious context, it means complex submission, uh, complete submission to the will, will of God. Uh, we told you that as we continue to go on, it says this. In order to become a Muslim, anybody tonight can become a Muslim. Uh, even here tonight, trust me, watch this. All you, uh, one, one who submits, Muslim means one who submits, a person must recite the Shahada, which is the Islamic creed in Arabic with a sincere heart. So if, somebody, if there was a Muslim evangelist outside tonight, uh, he would ask somebody if he was doing an exit poll and evangelizing, do you want to become a Muslim? All you would have to do is repeat some Islamic words, and there's not many of them. It's actually more words in English than it is in, Islam, uh, in, uh, in um, Arabic words, excuse me, than in Arabic. But if you did that with a sincere heart, you are a Muslim. So what is the Shahada? The Shahada is the tes testimony of faith in Islam. It's equivalent to our sinner's prayer. Uh, the first thing new Muslims should do is to recite the Shahada. How do you know someone is a, is a Christian? Not because they go to a Christian church. It's because they've said the sinner's prayer. So they understand John 3.16. And, so, and then they understand the Roman road. The English meaning of the Shahada is as follows. There is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his messenger or Muhammad is his prophet. That's the Shahada. The Shahada is also one of the five core fundamentals of Islam. We'll talk about the five pillars of Islam, Lord willing, in a couple weeks to come and tell you what they're, what they're required to do. Shahada. Uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. To become a Muslim, all you have to do is recite this statement with a sincere heart. Now, if there was somebody here that wanted to do that in English, uh, they also now have said, uh, Muslims said, you don't have to do it in Arabic because they're expanding in the world. You can do it in any language you want to do it in. Uh, expansion of this, they actually, it's whispered into a newborn baby and it's the last utterance that the, before, that, before someone dies. So it's extremely important to them. Are you a Muslim? Listen, this is on Facebook. If you go into certain things, Facebook is putting this out. Muslims are putting this out all over Facebook. Yeah, I believe there is no God, but all, all you have to do is say it that Muhammad is, holy, is God's holy prophet. I believe in Islam is the only one true religion. Uh, there, there's, the, there's the Arabic for it. And yes, I'm Muslim and believe all of the above. Or no, you click on it, and when you click on it, you become a Muslim. So this is, 
this is something that is that is obviously trying to get everybody in the world. So we see this Shahada declar is really their declaration of faith. There it is in Arabic. Uh, it's Allah ilha ilaha Muhammad Rasulah. Ilah in Arabic. And believe me, by me saying that, I have not become a Muslim because I do not believe it in my heart. Amen. How many understand what we're talking about? So, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is, his me is the messenger of Allah. That is Shahada. Now, you don't understand it because, not that, you don't understand what I'm going to show you now, but everybody who speaks Arabic or Hebrew in the Middle East understands what I'm going to put up next. It's foreign to you, it's, foreign, it's not foreign to me because I know a little bit of Arabic. I can read it, but this is the Shahada. Now, that is Arabic. It's written in a really strange way. It's written from right to left, just like Hebrew. And uh, that is something that you may not be familiar with, but it is everywhere in the Middle East. If I take you to Israel, you will see that a hundred times a day if I show you where to watch for it. Now watch. We, it is the equivalent of our John 3.16. How many of you ever know that people have seen people at a football game raise up a sign, John 3.16? How, how many of you have ever seen that? How many of you have never seen that? Well, if you, for those of you who haven't never seen that, there it is. John 3.16. Look at this guy. Right there. John 3.16. If you're familiar with uh, a football player who used to be the uh, quarterback of the Florida Gators, uh, he's, he had John 3.16 under his, in black under his eyes, Tim Tebow. Or maybe you've seen it like this at some type of outing. John 3.16. This is what the Shahada is to somebody who's a Muslim. They're extreme, but they go a little bit further, and let me give it to you. They wear it at killing events, jihad, Holy War. That is the Shahada. So whenever you, and I know you've seen that in the news somewhere. Whenever you see that, that's their declaration. That's their John 3.16. That's their, their declaration of faith. They wear it when they go to war. Holy Jihad. And they teach their children to wear it and when they're going to war. And by the way, that is always re represented, right here is always representative of you're doing the will of Allah, submission to Allah. So when you see these things, these are very overt signs that someone is a Muslim, obviously, that someone is a, is a, commi a committed Muslim. So this is extremely important that we see it. They wear the Shahada, they wear it to go to war. I, can just, I just can't imagine U.S. Christian soldiers wearing John 3.16 on their foreheads while going to war to kill someone. I just can't imagine it. Because Christianity doesn't advocate killing as a, as a mainstream of our doctrine. It doesn't advocate it at all. In, in anything, Christianity teaches peace and it teaches to love your enemies. Even their children are urged to wear it and engage in war. So if their salvation message, listen, if, if this is their salvation message, why wear it to kill those who aren't Muslims? How many are following me tonight? Because Islam is not a religion. It is a civilization takeover. That should tell you right there. They are not wearing that so that they can go into battle and somebody can convert to Islam. They're wearing that because they're going into battle with people that are not Islamic. And they're wearing that to kill them. This should tell you a whole lot of the things they wear. And so here are, the, here are some of the facts that I've already shared in review, because I think you really need to go over them at times. The word Islam means submission again. The word Muslim means one who submits to Allah. To submit to Allah, you must know that Allah want what Allah wants. What does Allah want? The answer to this question is found in the holy books, quote unquote, that define Islam, the Quran and the Hadith. The goal of Islam is stated in the sacred books of Islam, is to subjugate the world under Islam by reason of, or which is Dawah, or by the sword. So there's one or two ways they can get the world into submission. By reasoning with them, and sometimes what they'll do is go into a town uh, in Syria or in Afghanistan, and there'll be Christians in that town. The, the Muslims will come in and they will conquer that town. Not ISIS, I'm talking about other Muslims. They will conquer that town. ISIS will kill the Christians. Other Muslims would come in and they'd ask to offer these Christians an opportunity to change to Islam to have the Shahada. If the Christians said no, then they would find something obscure to tax them on. They'd find every tree or every plant in their garden, and they'd tax them on there, and they wouldn't tax the Muslims, but they'd tax the Christians so they can leave. If they wouldn't leave and they paid the tax, then eventually they would kill them. They've been doing it for 1,400 years. That's why Islam has spread, has spread so much. So this is the thing that's going on. Islam defines a Muslim's nature of existence, not simply as religion as Western thinking construct. Islam is predominantly a religion of rules, practices, and observances that enable the faithful to earn their salvation by their own merit. That obviously go against, goes against Scripture. It's not by works. Somebody say amen. So what is Islam? Here we go. Uh, we, we can see a little bit more as we've taught you last week. Second largest religion in the world. 1.2 billion Muslims. 20% of the earth population. 
It began in modern-day Saudi Arabia. It's based on beliefs of Jews and Christians. Abraham is the first important figure. Belief in the same single God, they say. That is not true. Followers the, follows the teachings of the prophet Muhammad, and we're going to expose him tonight in, a, in, a, in this message so you can understand who Muhammad was. Now, as it goes on, I gave you some more statistics. I told you this. 21% uh, of the world's population, 1.2 billion people. It's the world's second largest, relig largest religion in the last 50 years. It grew 500%. It's the world's fastest growing religion. Over 65 nations in the world are Islamic. There are more Muslims in the United States than Episcopalians, more Muslims in the United States than Methodists, more Muslims in the United States than Jews. Built over thousand mosques in the United States, 80% in the last 15 years. Muslims desire Islam to be a mainstream religion in the United States, influencing American life and culture specifically through sh Sharia law. The historical overview, hard to teach 1400 years in just that uh, 45 minutes, but I told you, 570, Muhammad's born in Mecca. 610 AD, Muhammad receives divine visions, establishes Islam, submission to God. 622, he is rejected in Mecca. He flees and he gets a, uh, just a handful of followers and he settles in Medina where he builds an army to go back into Mecca. 629, Muhammad leads a pilgrimage back to Mecca. In order to get some of the money for his army, he robs caravans and steals the money so he can build up his troops. So just understand the history of this. 632 AD, Muhammad dies. Abu Bakr succeeds as head of Islam. By Muhammad's death, uh, Mecca and the nomadic tri tribes of Arabia converted to Islam. It's by the sword. 651 AD, Muhammad followers compile the Quran or the holy books that they say that were, uh, were Muhammad's visions. Short timeline. Let me tell you, it goes on. Let's skip all the way down to 622. Hijra, Muhammad and followers flee to Medina. 624, they successfully attack Meccan caravans. And uh, 625, they're defeated uh, by Meccans. The Meccans defeated him, by the way. 630, Muslims capture Mecca. Uh, Kaaba is cleansed. You'll see the picture of that tonight. And the pilgrim sites are Islamicized. Tribes in Arabia now allegi allegiance to Muhammad. 632 is death. Abu Bakr chosen. 680, death of uh, Husayn uh, marks the beginning of the Shia, Shia or Ali party. So it had a division around that time. Let me give you the bigger picture of it. Again, a lot of stuff. So 620, 622, 660, early expansion. 661 AD to 748, it's called the Umayyads. Uh, they, they led in all of the nations we see right now, Northern Africa, in the Middle East, which are mostly predominant, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Ku Kuwait, um, Oman, United Arab Emirates, uh, all those nations in Saudi Arabia and bordering Saudi Arabia, and then the Middle East, Turkey, uh, Iran, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Six, eight, those are all the nations that have been conquered by these groups uh, that took over. 868 to 962 Islamic kingdoms, 992 to 1194 uh, the Seljuks, which is Iran and the Turkey, they are now the predominant role in Islam. 1096 to 1291, they have taken over, but this time even, even Israel. And so all the holy sites that were built, listen, the three oldest churches on the planet were built in Israel by the Emperor Constantine's mother in 355 AD. Well, Islam wasn't satisfied with just taking its own people. They went and conquered all of those churches. Uh, Saladin was one of the ones that did it. And so crusades were, were, were organized to go and oust them from the Holy Land. Now, let me just give you a, a little caveat here. Crusades were as wicked as Islam was. So I'm not telling you the Crusades were great, but that's the reason why they did it, and they pillaged and plundered. And so, well, listen, whenever you fight for your God in a war to kill people and rape people, you're not fighting for the right God. I don't care what you say. So we see here the Christians uh, reconquest in Spain. And then in 1263, the uh, Ilkhanate, which is Iran, Islam is growing again. And then 1301 to 1846 is the Ottoman Empire. You probably have heard of about the Ottoman Empire. 1847 to 1956, European colonization. The West came in and fled into the Middle East and to, and to Europe. And we took control. We took control of almost everything. And that's why we're hated so much right now as the great Satan, because we took control of their lands. We took control of their monies, we took control of their products, and basically we set puppet governments up that had nothing to do with them, that were allegiant to the United States. Now, that's uh, all I can say right there. Somebody say, I get it. Somebody say, I don't get it all, but I get a little bit of it. All right. So, what I'm telling you about is there's a large history. Again, I cannot teach that in, a, in just one little setting, but I want you to understand that history. So then we move to our study tonight. Our study tonight is, is on Muhammad. Notice that figure that is raised up to, uh, to Allah, and he is holding the Quran, which, by the way, he never held, because it wasn't done until after his death. The fact, although they don't have any problem with showing you he held one. He was illiterate. Muhammad, and I'm going to tell you about Muhammad, and I'm going to be very fair. For those who are listening on the internet and, and, and you're listening on YouTube, I know what you're going to say, because every time you ever hear a Christian talk about Muhammad, they talk about the bad or the ugly things. I'm going to talk about the good also, because, because you have to be fair when you talk about someone. Somebody say amen. So I'm going to talk about Muhammad, and I'm going to title it this, The Good, The Bad, 
and the ugly. So here we go. This is what I'm going to read to you. I know you can't read all that, but I want to read it to you because I want you to get the gist of it so you can understand where this man comes from. Much, much is known about the life of Muhammad. Very much. Muhammad uh, lived, his life, uh, full, lived his life in full, uh, full history, in light of history, excuse me, lived his life in the full light of history. One scholar wrote, Every, a lot is known about Muhammad. He instantly had, had a notoriety, so it's not like there's things we don't know about, and we know almost more about him than almost any other uh, historical figure. Listen, Muhammad was born in Mecca on April 20th, 570 AD. His full name was Muhammad bin Abdullah. Bin is the word for uh, son. Uh, in Hebrew, it's bin. Uh, Muhammad's father was the chief of a pagan worshiping tribe called Koresh. Does that sound weird? Like David Koresh. Muhammad's father was Abda. Now listen to this. Abda Allah ibn Abd al-Mutalib. Why could they just name him Ben? Anyway, Abd Allah means slave of Allah. I got a problem right there. How in the world could his father be called the slave of Allah before he had a son who would invent Islam and worship Allah? If Allah wasn't worshipped. Because it's the slave of Il Alia, the moon god. So Allah is a moon god that, that Muhammad elevated to the supreme god. One of many pagan gods. So, you still follow me tonight? His father died soon after his son's birth. His father was the youngest son of Abdul Muttalib. Muhammad was orphaned early in his life after his mother died and was raised by his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, then chief of the Quraysh tribe, and his uncle, Abu Talib, uh, beginning at the age of six. Now, all of this is new to you. Every Muslim knows this. Every single Muslim knows this, and they will easily tell you things about this. Earlier, about five years old, while in the care of a Bedouin nurse named Halima, Muhammad beca became subject to epileptic seizures. Muhammad was an epileptic. The things, the uh, visions he had, he knew were caused by epilepsy. And so just listen to it. At nine, Muhammad went on a merchandising expedition to Syria. It was while his, with his grandfather and uncle that Muhammad learned, le learned to be lordly and to exercise power, to fast, to pray at certain specified times of the day. The Korosh tribe, they're all tribes, prayed to idols at sunrise, at noon, and at sunset. And they faced the direction of the idol, black stone, the Kaaba. That Kaaba that they walk around, he had to go and cleanse. That has 200 false gods in it, even now. And so basically what he says is, Allah is above any other god. Even though they won't claim that there's 200 gods there, we know, people have told us, the insiders that have come away from it, that there are, go there are gods there. So while away from Arabia, he saw the sacred place of the Jews. He stood on the spot where King of Salem came out and did obese obeisance to Abraham. He was shown the place where his great mother, the bondwoman Hagar, went forth leading Ishmael by the hand. He saw Damascus, the city of the desert, and Sinai, the mountain of the law. He then returned to Mecca full of visions and dreams. His teen years were as a shepherd and an attendant of caravans. At the age of 20, Muhammad was hired by a wealthy woman named Khadija to marry her late husband's, uh, to, ma to manage her late husband's caravan business. He hired her. She hired him. When Muhammad was 25, he married Khadija, who proposed to him. She was 40. Six children were born to them. Only one survived to adulthood, which was the beloved daughter Fatima. Well, in the caravan business, Muhammad happened to make many journeys to Syria and Palestine, and he became very, very familiar with Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Extremely familiar. During this time, Muhammad became acquainted with the, both the Jews and the Christians in their writings. Later, the monk like Muhammad would cause things to be written in the Quran about both Jewish and Christian history, which shows that Muhammad did not possess an intellect befitting a historian. He was called the prophet, but every time we see in the Quran where Muhammad prophesied, all you have to do is look at history, every single one of his prophecies, including how Rome would come in later on, didn't come to pass, or false prophecies. You know what the Bible says, if you have a false prophet, what you do? You stone them. So Muhammad could not read or write, he was illiterate. In fact, the Quran says Muhammad was illiterate, Surah 7, 157. The marriage to the much older Khadija, who was 40 years old, and who had been married twice before, proved to be very fortunate for Muhammad. He suddenly became equal to the richest men in Mecca. While married to Khadija, um, Muhammad did not marry any other wife. Uh, she probably wouldn't let him. However, after she died, Muhammad would show no restraint in his self-gratification for lust with multiple wives, slaves, captives, and even his own adoptive son, Zaid's wife, which he took to wife. His youngest bride, Aisha, was nine years old when he married her and consummated that marriage. 
Uh, Khadija gave Muhammad two sons, both of whom died young. You notice how all of his children are dying young. They, both have, they also have four daughters. Their names were Rieka, Kolathum, Zeniel, all who died young. Uh, in his older age, Muhammad used to color his hair red or to hide his gray hair. He had a large, listen to this, it's gross. He had a large, hairy, egg-sized mole under his left shoulder. Now, why would I tell you that? Just listen. Not being able to find any prophecy of Muhammad coming in the Bible, many foolish Arabs have tried to tie this hairy mole into Isaiah chapter 9, where it says this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's it. The mole was on his shoulder. Listen, this is a scam. How many are with me tonight? How many are learning a little bit tonight? So just let me get through this just a little bit for you so you can understand the history of this, so you understand what's going on. When I talk about Islam, I know what I'm talking about. I've done the history on Islam. I understand who the founder is. Let me tell you something. Anytime you want to find out about a religion, you better find out about the founder because the, fa the religion is only as good as the founder. Somebody say amen. Whether it's David Koresh or Jim Jones or Mohammed, what was that person like? What were they claiming about that person? What did that person do? And tonight, we're going to have an expose on Mohammed. So, uh, so not being able to find that, he says that they use this verse saying the government should be on his shoulder. Let me give you this one as we go a little bit further. Right here. People used to ask Muhammad's favorite child, Bride Aisha, how the prophet lived at home. Like any ordinary man, she answered. He would sleep, sweep the house, stitch his own clothes, mend his own sandals. I don't know. But I'm not, I guess I'm not ordinary. Uh, water the camels, milk the goats, help the servants to work and eat his meals with them. And he would go fetch a thing we needed from the market. He was pretty much a servant at home. Aisha, only nine when he married her, believed whatever Muhammad told her about his divine inspiration. Muhammad claimed that he used to get revelations from Allah only when he slept and had physical relationship with Aisha. Now, why is it that Gabriel didn't bother to visit him when Muhammad spent nights with other wives in his harem? Uh, by the way, that's reference from Adiha, uh, from Zahi Bukhara, which is a book that he wrote. Muhammad used to get divine inspiration only in Alicia's bed. Uh, 347, 755, it's also in the Quran. Uh, Aisha did not see Gabriel when Muhammad introduced Gabriel to her. Aisha said that the prophet said to her, Oh, Aisha, this is Gabriel, and he sends his greetings, salutations to you. He said this to her. It's in the Quran. He's, he's making Gabriel greet her, and she says this, Salutations and greetings to him, and all his mercy and blessing be on him. And addressing the prophet, she turns and she says, You see what I don't see. So obviously, this is a, this is a, a religion that's based on one man, one man, who says this is what happened. Let me tell you something. Whenever you base your entire life on just a man, you're in trouble. I don't care if it's a preacher, you're in trouble. You've got to base your life on a, on a source of truth. And that source of truth has to be someone that, uh, that is concretely proven through his eyewitnesses that are there. So, she, he says that there is a there is an angel that appears to him. Let me remind you of what Scripture says. And the angel gives him the things that he's supposed to write down. I have no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Man, that is a scary verse. That means that some people who even play, preach the gospel may be doing it for their own cause or for Satan's cause. Especially when you see something about, like, Muhammad. So, uh, now, to be fair... We must report the full life of Muhammad. I want to do that. It's an error to say that all Muslims do that Muhammad was his history's greatest moral example. That's an error. However, it's the same critics claim that he was the story's, history's worst moral example. That's also an error. Neither is true. Uh, it's more accurate to say this. He was history's most confusing moral example. Many times, Satan appears at this, as this angel of light. So let me tell you about the good. You ready? Muhammad. The good, the bad, and the evil. The good. Muhammad had many positive characteristics. I told you his, his life was open. He was not a, he was not, um, he had many positive characteristics. We know that he was courageous to stand behind what he believed. Uh, we know that because he was patiently endured several years of persecution, while he had no army, he endured all that persecution patiently, waiting several years uh, in that persecution in Mecca and and because he fought in numerous raids and battles. But throughout his life, Muhammad placed an emphasis on helping orphans and widows. This is the real intrigue. If you look at Hamas, 
who's Muslim, one of the biggest reasons why they have followers is they take a lot of money and they help orphans and widows. Very, very, very uh, demonstrative in their helps. And so it's confusing to people. Islam, one of the five pillars of Islam, as you will see, is to give alms. They give more than Christians give. It's required for them to give or they can't get to heaven. So, so just listen to this. He placed uh, emphasis on helping orphans and widows. There were times when he showed great mercy. He was an ardent monotheist. He despised idolatry. He told his followers, this is a positive sign, to heed God's prophets like Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. These are areas where even non-Muslims would agree that Muhammad exhibited positive traits. That's the good. Then we have the bad. You still with me tonight? Muslims tend to focus solely on the good characteristics of their prophets and completely ignore the less admirable qualities. Muhammad began robbing caravans after leaving Mecca. He was a thief. As a result, greed soon became one of his primary factors in people's rapid conversion to Islam. Indeed, Muhammad deliberately used the spoils of war to lure people to Islam. He paid them, especially those who were in great power and prominence. When he was criticized for the way he distributed his newfound wealth, he replied this, quote, are you disturbed in mind because of the good things of this life by which I win over people that they may become Muslim while I entrust you to your Islam? Although Muhammad patiently endured persecution in Mecca, his attitude quickly changed when his numbers grew in Medina and he, and he grew an army. Soon he would tolerate no criticism whatsoever. And that's why you see it tonight. That's why you see uh, Hebdo, the, uh, the cartoonist magazine in, in France, being, being bombed because they drew something against Muhammad. They will not tolerate anything that, the, that deters from the image of Muhammad. He wouldn't. And he demanded his followers to uphold him no matter what. Listen, the first time I get up here and tell you this, listen, you know Mark Carell. If anybody ever says anything about me negatively, I want you to hurt them. What would you think of me? But that's exactly what Muhammad did. It's still going on today. Now watch. Um, according to our earliest biographical source, a man named Abu Afaq, who was more of 100 years old, wrote a poem criticizing people for converting to Islam. Muhammad demanded that he be killed, and Abu Afaq was murdered in his sleep. When a woman named Asma heard the Muslims had, had killed such an elderly man, she wrote a poem calling for people to take a stand against Islam. Uh, it relates this, this uh, Ibn Ishaq, which is a book, relates what happens next. Quote, when the prophet heard that what she had said, he said, who will rid me of Morwar's daughter? Umiyar bin Aidi al-Kamati, who was with him, heard him, and that uh, very night he went to her house and he killed her because she wrote that poem. You still with me tonight? In the morning he came to the prophet and he told him what he had done. You have helped God and his apostle, the martyr said, or the prophet said. Asked if he would be, bear any, any problem for this and con evil consequences. Here's what Muhammad said to him. Two goats won't butt their heads about her. Don't worry about it. Muhammad's violence was directed towards groups as well. Muhammad once said to his followers, I will expel the Jews and the Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave anyone except Muslims. The Jews of Kurza resisted Muhammad and attempted to form an alliance against him. When the alliance faltered, Muhammad acted quickly. His army surrounded them and besieged them for 21 days until they were sore pressed and God cast terror into their hearts, he said. Then they surrendered. Well, Muhammad immediately confined them in, in Medina. Then Muhammad went out to the market of Medina, which is still there today, by the way, and uh, dug trenches in it. You'll see this in, 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 a, in the news. He buried the people up to their necks, and once they were buried up to their necks, men, women, and children, he decapitated them. How many? 800 to 900. Every male who had reached puberty was killed Muhammad divided the women and children that he didn't kill among property among his men, taking a fifth of the spoils for himself. So the ugly, like it can get any uglier. Things get worse. As the Muslim army was raided town after town, they captured many, many women who would often be sold or traded. He was a, he, he was a slave trader. Yet since the Muslim men were long away from their wives, they needed wisdom from Allah to guide them in the treatment of their female captives. It wasn't long before Muhammad received a revelation allowing the soldiers to sleep with the women they captured. Allah's messenger Muhammad sent an army to Atas and encountered the enemy and fought them. Having overcome them and taken them captives, the companions of Allah's messenger seemed to refrain from having intercourse with the captives and the captive women because their husbands were, were polytheists. Their husbands were still living. Uh, it says, Then Allah Most High sent down a word to Muhammad saying, And women already married except those whom your right hand possesses, you, they are lawful for you to have sexual intercourse with. So what they're saying is, you capture somebody, they're married, uh, because you've captured them in a holy war, you can do anything you want to them. Listen, the, the ver this verse of Quran, uh, the Quran, along with others, grants Muslims the right to have sex with their female captives and slave girls, even those who are still married, 
who are going or who are going to be sold or, or traded. This is a barbaric founding of this religion. Perhaps the most disturbing of all is the fact that Muslims could have sex with girls who hadn't even reached puberty. The opening chapter of ch 65 of the Quran presents Islamic rules for divorce according to 654. If a Muslim divorces a girl who hasn't yet reached puberty, he must three, make three months to make sure she isn't pregnant. So obviously, this is, this is uh, pedophilia. Muhammad himself had, had intercourse with a pubescent girl. His courtship of Isha began when she was six years old. He had a dream about her, which led him to believe that God wanted him to marry the young girl. Fortunately, Muhammad waited three years. Since Muhammad is the moral example in Islam, his actions are still affecting young girls today. This is exactly what Islam, the Islam thing, there's no problem with this, because their founder had no problem with it. How many, how many are understanding this? So if you want to talk about Islam as a religion, it's nothing like it. I want you to understand that, uh, like it or not, there are some of, these are some of the facts of the founder of Islam. Quite a different story than the sinless life of Jesus, isn't it? It's quite a different story than the, than the apostles in Scripture, is it not? Listen, Isaiah 53.9 tells us this. It says, uh, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence. This is Jesus. This is a, a prophecy of Jesus. Now, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Think of it. Just to oppose it, Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus is, obviously, Christianity is around Christ, so Jesus is our founder. And think about our founder, and think about Muhammad. Jesus never had a wife. Jesus devoted himself to God. Jesus was sinless. Muhammad did everything imaginable that you could think of that was a sin. Now, he may have started out his life nice. He may have started out as nice as his life as a, a person that was helping someone and a person that was, that was morally sound, but that's not the way he ended his life. Let me give you an example. Jim Jones, if you really know the story about Jim Jones, all we know the story about Jim Jones is what the media has told us after he had put to death so many people in Guyana, South America. But Jim Jones was a tremendous preacher. He was an Assembly of God preacher in California. He helped people. His church grew to over 5,000 people at one point because he helped people. He had all, he has his doors open all day long and he would help people, counsel them, give them things. People came to him in mass. That's why they trusted him. He was good at the beginning. He brought them in. He did something for them. He, he satisfied a need. This is the whole idea of a cult. A cult pulls you in because it satisfies your need. It gives you something. It hits your emotions. It hits your, it hits your physical needs. And then what happens is that messenger of light, that, in that transformed messenger of light, will now bring you into that depth of whatever he wants to do. That's why people get caught up in cults. That's why people get caught up in Islam. That's why people get caught up with who, who Muhammad was. But when you think about Jesus, listen, the Bible says this. It says that his grave was assigned to the, to, with the wicked, but he had no God. It says, but no crushed reed will he break, and no smoldering wick will he extinguish. In faithfulness he will be, bring justice. If I could bring Jesus physically in, in here today, he would be the most mild man you could possibly imagine. He would, you would see love in his eyes. You'd see compassion in his eyes because the Bible prophesied of the way he was. He would suffer little children to come unto him. Jesus was the ultimate person that would say that, that you would see love exuding from. The only ones he ever got angry with were religious people who thought they knew better and they could mistreat people. Are you with me today? Jesus never mistreated anyone. Jesus would, would turn the other cheek totally against Islam. I don't know how anybody in the planet could think that Islam is something they should follow, especially when they think they should hurt someone. God forbid we hurt anyone. Amen. You're with me tonight? Yes, Alright, let's go on a little bit further so I can show you what's going on. Even Paul said this, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. And I really like this article by a guy, I have no idea who he is. Many cults start off with high ideals that get corrupted by leaders or their board of advisors who become power hungry and dominant and control members' lives. No group with high ideals start off as a cult. They become one when their errant ways are exposed. One of the worst things that can happen to a young, good pastor, a fire-breathing pastor, is to become famous. One of the worst things to happen is to get a following and believe, that get his head... Saul's problem was his head was bigger than his helmet. And that's what happens. You believe. I, I found out a long time ago, the thing you want to do in life is, if you're a pastor, if somebody in position, you don't want to believe everybody that says you're great, and you don't want to believe everybody that says you're terrible. You just want to do what God's called you to do. Come on. Amen? Look, Muslims often claim that Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible. And I'm not just talking about his hairy shoulder mole. They quote Deuteronomy. 
is one of their fundamental quotes. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and I will put my, my word in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Muslims use this as one of their fundamental truths of faith. It's from your Bible, Deuteronomy. So when, they, when you talk to a Muslim, if you ever talk to them and they open up your Bible and they show you Deuteronomy 18 and they tell you that prophet, that's why we call him the prophet Muhammad. Let me tell you something. Most Christians won't have any answer for that. But I'm going to give you an answer for it tonight. I'm going to tell you how wrong that is and what they say it because that they're taking it totally out of context. We know from the context of Deuteronomy that this is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. It's about Jesus. He was to be a country, be a countryman, an Israel, uh, an Israelite. Jesus was called a prophet in Luke chapter 13. Verse 33, he came from among his brethren, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. He spoke what the Father told him. That's in John 8, 28. Muslims say that Psalm 45, verses 3 to 5 is about Muhammad. They say, gird the sword, thy sword upon thy thigh, O must mighty, with the glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach the, ter the, the terrible things. Thy arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. They use Psalms and they say this is about Muhammad. Muhammad is the prophet of the sword. As a matter of fact, in the Quran, it, it, you, if you see it, it has crossed swords in the beginning of the Quran. The sword goes hand in hand with Islam. But this is not talking about Muhammad at all. This, this is spoken of in this passage of God himself. And secondly, Jesus in Revelation and the vision of Jesus in Revelation from John, Jesus is coming back with a sword in his hand. The Bible says this is about Jesus. It says, and he had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth, excuse me, when a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. So what they've said is this is about Muhammad. Not Revelation, but they're talking about Psalms. This is about Muhammad, the one that's coming with a sword. When, when Psalms is really talking about God who comes with a sword against his enemy, and of course Jesus who comes with the sword. And then we see that Jesus has that sword in Revelation, but we also see this in Revelation. It says, and the remnant were slain, this is the battle of Armageddon, with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Revelation 1921. Jesus is coming back with a sword from his mouth. This is not about Muhammad, Psalm isn't. It's about the returning Christ. Listen, I want you to understand, Muslims say that the comforter, the parakletos in Greek, mentioned in John 14, 16, they say, by the way, Jesus is coming back. Somebody say amen. amen. And uh, listen, it says this, Jesus said this in John 14, 16, I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter. That in the Greek is the word parakletos, uh, that you may abide with you forever. Muhammad people who follow Muhammad in Islam say this is a statement that Jesus made about Muhammad. God forbid. Listen, that is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a direct blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The Quran refers to Muhammad as Allah's parakletos. They actually use the Greek to tell you that. Surah 61 6. Here it is. Recall that Jesus, son of Mary, this is the Quran, said, O children of Israel, I am God's messenger to you, confirming the Torah and bringing good news of a messenger to come after me, whose name will be Ahmad, which is Muhammad. Then when he should show them the clear proofs, they said, this is profound magic. Then he is the one who sent his messenger with the guidance and religion of truth and will make it dominate all religions in spite of idol worshippers. What they're saying, they're stealing what Jesus said and stealing about about the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're saying the power of the Holy Spirit is really Jesus talking about Allah, about excuse me, about Muhammad, Ahmed, that is coming. He is the one that will come after him. You see, Islam thinks that Judaism was, was right. God came and gave and revealed it to the prophets, and then Christianity came and it was right. Now they believe that Islam is the next step. They believe that you haven't got a full revelation of who Allah is. You are an infidel, you are an idol worshiper, you are someone that doesn't understand the next step. The next step is that Jesus told you that, uh, that Muhammad was coming. And so Islam believes they're the next step in the progression of God. Now, if Muhammad were alive today, I would arrest him. You know why I would arrest him? Does anybody know why I'd arrest him? Does anybody want to know why I'd arrest him? I'd arrest him for identity theft. He stole, he stole the nature and the character and the words of Jesus. He stole them. He took them right out of the Bible and he stole them. He put them on himself and he made himself something that he was not. You know who else? Every cultist 
leader you can find steals something from Christ. They steal something from the Bible. They steal it and they apply it to themselves. Or they take scripture and they twist it and say, this is what it means. So that they can manipulate people. Muhammad hated the people of Mecca. He hated them. The only reason he actually even became anything famous was because he wanted to have vengeance against the people who rejected him. So he went to Medina, who were, uh, who were miscreates and outcasts, and he collected an army, robbed caravans, built up a treasury, brought, paid people to fight for him, went back and killed those people who didn't like him, him, and I rejected him and eventually they actually defeated him several times went back and then defeated them finally in Mecca and took over their worship their pagan worship and made it Islam to Il Alia man how many of you did not know that how many of you knew that and then why didn't you teach that <laughs> so let me give you let me tell you something tonight before we close the real difference between Muhammad and Jesus Christ Muhammad was the prophet of war Christ is the prince of peace Muhammad's disciples killed for their faith. Christ's disciples were killed for their faith. Muhammad promoted persecution against infidels. Christ forgave and converted the chief persecutors, 1 Timothy. Muhammad was the taker of life. Christ was the giver of life, John 10. Muhammad and his fellow warriors murdered thousands. Christ murdered none, but died for all, John 12, 48. Muhammad's method to his religion was compulsion. Christ's aim was voluntary relationship by conversion, Acts 3. Muhammad practiced forced. Christ preached faith, John 6. Muhammad was a warrior. Christ was the deliverer. Colossians 1.13. Muhammad was swift to shed blood. Christ shed his own blood for the salvation of many. Ephesians 1. Muhammad preached death to the infidels. Christ prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23. Islamic terrorists derive their inspiration from Muhammad and carry out their despicable atrocities in the name of his God. Christians give their lives as missionaries, deriving their inspiration from the one who said, Go into all the world and blessed are the peacemakers. Matthew 28. Muhammad, believe it or not, hated music. He would not have music anywhere. Jesus and the disciples sang hymns, and the apostle commanded the Lord's church to sing, Matthew chapter 26. The Muslim's only true hope for eternity is to die as a martyr in jihad, where Muhammad has promised sensual pleasure with 72 virgins and the promise of many, many wives. Jesus promised the joy of eternal life to all who by faith will trust him as their personal Savior and Lord. Muhammad said the witness of a woman was half the value of a witness of a man. And Muhammad said a woman goes to paradise because she satisfies her husband sexually. The Bible teaches that a husband is to love his wife submitting one to another and to be willing to die for her as Christ would die for the church in Ephesians 5.25. Muhammad's mission was to conquer the world for Allah. Christ's mission was to conquer sin's penalty and power through his substitutionary atonement, 2 Corinthians. Muhammad teaches a God above us. Moses teaches a God above us and God with us. Jesus teaches a God above us, a God with us, and a God in us. If you return to the tomb of Muhammad in Medina, you will find it occupied. You will find Muhammad's bones. They're still there. When you go to Christ's tomb, found outside the wall, of Jerusalem, you will immediately discover that that tomb is empty. Now let me ask you, are you really a profound question? Are you going to bet your eternal life on the one who came back from the dead or the one who is still in the grave? Let me ask the people that are listening tonight, are you going to bet your life on someone who lied, who cheated, who was a pedophile, who was a robber and a thief and someone who is still in the grave and their bones are still there? Or are you going to bow down to Jesus Christ who is no longer dead but is alive forevermore and who never hurt anyone? So to say that Islam and Christianity are the same, which the Pope has recently done, by the way, to say that we have the same little path going to the same destination, and that that math just doesn't work. Let me show you by returning to the path we call the road to Damascus. Both Paul and Muhammad were on the same route. I told you that before. Paul was confronted with the resurrection of Christ, convicted of his sin by the faith, and chose Christianity. Immediately, his life changed. He went from a heart full, heart full of hatred, sent on a mission to kill those who did not believe like him, to loving those who did not fully understand his faith in Christ, saying, I would even give my own, this is what Paul said, listen to it, I would even give my own life, I would die and go to hell, this is what Paul said, if it would mean that the Jewish nation would recognize Messiah. You know what I call that? I call that the Christ factor. The Christ factor is so different. The Quran, Quran says this, do the five pillars and when you die, if all is in a good mood that day, you might get into Paris, paradise. Now think about grace because Islam has none of it. There's not a single shred of grace in any of the teachings of Islam. It's kill, destroy, make them like you. It has nothing about grace. If a woman, is if a woman has, has, a, has a sin and she has, she's shown her face to, to a man she shouldn't, they can mercy kill her. 
If a, in Arizona, it happened a couple of years ago, and still happened. A Muslim family, the, one, the girl go, uh, was a teenager. She was dating a Christian named Mercy Killed Her. Her brother killed her. Listen, is this grace? Sharia law says, if you steal something from me, I'm going to cut off your hands. You know who says that? The, the old man says that. That's the revenge part that says that. You would love to cut somebody's hands off that steal. That's not the way you're supposed to go. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. It has no grace at all. But listen to, listen to Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Islam is based on works. You'll see that next week. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of, a, of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh could be justified. There's nothing you can do tonight to earn your way to heaven. There is nothing you can do. You can give a million dollars into the offering. Mark Crow Ministries will be extremely thankful. <laughs> But it won't get you into heaven. Amen. You can help all the poor you want. It's not going to get you into heaven. You can help all the... All the you can go to missionary... Uh, uh, you can go to one nation after another as a missionary. It won't get you into heaven. I promise you there's some missionaries, Christian missionaries, that won't get to heaven. Because maybe they're missionaries and they're doing a job, but maybe their hearts are far from Christ and they've never really gotten saved. How many are with me tonight? It's, it's judging of the heart. It's not the, the works that we do. Islam is all about works. We'll tell you about those five pillars. Working to kill yourself as a martyr to get to heaven. Can you imagine? That's about works. Um, like praying. They pray all the time. People say, oh, we should be like Muslims. They pray all the time. I've been in Israel. And in Israel, I'm on a bus. And so Israel is filled with with Muslims and Jews, and they ride together. Trust me, they work together. And I'd be on a bus, and all of a sudden, uh, you would hear from a minaret the call to prayer on a loudspeaker. And in the bus, you will see Muslims take out their little prayer rugs, throw them down on the aisle, bunch up to each other, and they will kneel down and pray their prayer to Allah five times a day. When the bus turns, they hop. Because they have to face Mecca. This is a work. Okay? These are Muslims at work. They're working to earn their salvation. They don't even know if they're going to get it. Let me tell you something. It's probably one of the massive, most massive prayer meetings you've ever seen. That's the Kaaba. Those white specks are Muslims kneeling down in prayer. I had one person say to me, don't you wish Christians could pray like that? No, I don't. I don't wish, because they say the same prayer. It's a vain repetition. They say the same thing over and over and over again. It's mindless. Now watch. Or they think that they can dress a certain way. And that'll get them holiness. You can wrap yourself up in cellophane till you're blue in the face. You can put every cloth on the planet over you. That's not going to hide your, height, your, your sin. Amen. Working and praying five times a day facing Mecca. Dressing a certain way. Trying, trying, trying to please and appease Allah. If Islam were a car rental company, it would remind me of this. Everything they do is trying to appease Allah. Think about it. They want to appease their God. Jesus never requires that. He did things to appease our sin. Totally opposite. In Islam, you can pit a big giant bull bar with flashing lights to draw attention to each one who passes by saying, we're just like Avis. We try harder. We really try harder. We keep on trying harder until we day, the day we die. There are over again one billion Muslims in our world today. Each one of them, let me say this and let me actually say this in, into YouTube. Each one of them matters to God. Pray for them. Love them. Encourage them. I have Muslim friends that I dearly love in Israel. I'll visit them next time I go. If you meet them in your path, engage them in conversation. Show them the difference that Christ makes by showing them Christ, the Christ factor in your life. Don't sit back and ignore them while they walk. And please don't roll your eyes and say, oh, how stupid. The five pillars, four noble truths. Look at them. Don't say that. These are not your enemies. These are confused people following what they think is real. And it's a lie. Be real. Be full of Christ. Speak the truth in love. Because they're in a prison. And you've been set free. Amen. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. They're in a prison. You're not. My conclusion tonight is this. When Jesus was dying on the cross for your sins and mine, he was crucified, as you know, between two criminals. One of the criminals said, hey, just go ahead and jump down. Take us all down off the cross with you. You can do it if you're really God and if you're really the Messiah. The other criminal said, hey, don't listen to him. We deserve it, but this man has done nothing wrong. Please remember me in your kingdom. Jesus turned to his criminal. That criminal, he said, he could hear, that he could see, he could feel his faith. And he said this to him. From this day forward, you will spend eternity with me in paradise because of your faith and because of your love. How do you get into heaven? You don't have to join a church. It's nice if you did, but you don't have to join a church. You don't have to get baptized. 
You don't have to have communion. We have put so many determinations on getting to church. All you have to do is believe by faith and you'll be saved. The thief did absolutely no work at all. He hung on the cross. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now let me ask you, what if instead of Christ being crucified, Muhammad was there on the cross? Muhammad would say, well, you've got to do the Avis thing. You really have to try harder. I've set up these five pillars. You've got to do the creed, the prayer, the almsgiving, you know the drill. And well, if you're really good and hope that all is having a good day, then perhaps he'll let you into heaven. Which man would you rather follow? I'd rather follow one that says, all you have to do is believe. Christianity is the easiest thing on the planet to do. All you have to do is believe. What did Jesus say? It's about a relationship, not a religion. It's by faith, not by fear. It's not a cost, it's free. That's what makes Christianity different than Islam and every other religion. I call it the Christ factor. Now closely listen to me because someone's not going to hear what I'm saying tonight and you're going to misinterpret it. So I really want you to hear me. So someone on, on YouTube may, or even here tonight uh, on the internet may email me and say something like this. Pastor Mark, now listen closely. Are you telling me that Jesus is the only way to God? No. Now listen. Please don't misunderstand me or what I'm saying. I'm not telling you Jesus is the only way to secure eternal life. Jesus told you it's the only way to secure eternal life. It's not me telling you that. It's the words of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's the saddest part of Islam. The saddest part of Islam is millions have died in this faith. And millions who have died in this faith cannot see and will not see and are not seeing the face of God. I want Islam to get saved. I want Islam to, to lay down. I want to see Muslims come to the Lord. Islam isn't my threat. Islam isn't a threat to me. Jesus will take care of me. Perfect love casts out all fear. You can let as many Islamic people you want in America. If, let me tell you something. If we really understood, if we were really the church that we're supposed to be, we would say this, bring them in. And what we will do, we'll start some prayer meetings for Islamics that are coming into our country. We will start some outreach to Muslims that are here. You're getting them in your own backyard. You're getting them in a spot that says, man, they're here. We can preach them. We don't have to go to the foreign land to preach to somebody who's a Muslim. Do you understand? It's the world looks at it and says, oh, no more refugees. We're going to stop them. They're killing us. Why don't we say this? Bring the refugees in. Let them come in. We'll set up the church to minister to them. We'll set up the church to be Christ-like. We will convert them. They're coming to us. Let's convert them. Maybe that's a novel statement, but that's exactly what Jesus said. Go ye into all the world. And now he's sending the world to us. It's the last days and we have an opportunity to reach them. Come on, somebody say amen. I'm closing. It's the second time I said it. I said it the third time. Take out your tomatoes and throw them. <laughs> Look, I don't care if Muhammad was a good man. I don't care if he was a bad man. I don't even care if he was an ugly man or an evil man. I care if he was right or wrong. And Muhammad, according to Jesus, was dead wrong. You serve a risen Savior who's in the world today, not as a dead man, whose bones are, in a, are not in a cave in a far-off land. And Muhammad always wanted people on his side. Muhammad never said that he can help us or make us secure, or bring us strength. It was always about him and what he was teaching. It was always about, come on my side, convert, convert him any way you can, bring him over to my side. As a matter of fact, he went to war with anyone who wasn't on his side. And he never once said he would be on our side. Never once does the Quran say it's on your side and fight for us. How very different Jesus is. Tonight, it's time for us to declare ourselves on the Lord's side because he's always on our side. Declare yourself on the Lord's side. Don't let things overcome you in life. Don't let things make you afraid. Declare yourself on the Lord's side. If God be for you, who can be against you? Notice he steps out for you first. For the Lord Jesus brings strength. Muhammad doesn't bring strength. Islam doesn't bring strength. They think they can overcome by strength. But Islam, reading the Quran, doesn't promise you strength. Listen, it says to those who put their trust in him, in the face of doubt, fear, or depression, declares yourself on the Lord's side and he will be, be your strength. Islam's not your strength. Islam is only a strength to conquer the world. Listen, it goes on. It says this, abide in his presence. Put your burdens on Jesus for he will sustain you, guard you, and guide you when you're on his side and declare it. Let me tell you something. If, you, if someone's a Muslim tonight and they're listening to this, let me tell you, you never have said this. Muhammad, you are on my side and you help me when I feel 
feel bad. You help me when I feel low. No, what you say is, what can I do for you, Mohammed? Where Jesus says, what, it's not the way you can do for me, it's what I can do for you. It's a whole different thing. I can strengthen you. I can help you. I can give you hope. I can lift you up when you're down. That is not Islamic statements. Islam says, you better do this for me. You better conquer the world. You better submit. You are living in a freedom tonight. You are living with a God who cares about you every single moment of your life. You are living on the right side of, of God. You are living not under Allah. You are living on, under Jehovah, God the Father. Muhammad could and would and never be able to do that for anyone. He's a dead man in a dead man's grave. Jesus is a living Savior living in the hearts of his followers today. If this was an Islamic meeting and you were bowing down and you were worshiping uh, Muhammad, let me tell you something. He would not be in any one of your hearts. All you would be doing is trying to be doing something to, for him. But tonight, you came in here with G. You're a Christian. You came in here and Jesus came in here with you because he lives inside you. He is inside your heart. Let me tell you something. Islam is an outside religion. He's outside everyone that fights for him and dies for him. But Jesus is an inside religion. How do I know I have him? Because I feel him in my heart. He's right here. He touches me. He helps me. He helps me grow. He helps me do things. He gives me strength. Oh, come on. You've got to know that you are on the right side of this thing. And you've got to know that God will sustain you. And he will help you. And he will care for you. And you know what? I wish the whole world can know that. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? That's part three. The founder of Islam. Now before I pray for you tonight, let me ask you a question. I really would rather talk about Scripture instead of telling you what the Surah says. But, notice I've put Scripture in there so that you understand what we believe. This is not about elevating Islam or Muhammad. Anything but that. This is about giving us knowledge because the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Giving us a compassion and reemphasizing that you have made... Here's the interesting thing about it. You have made a commitment to Christ, but you didn't choose Him. He chose you. This is something that He did for you and for me. Think about yourself. You could have been born in a grass hut in Vietnam. You could have been born in Afghanistan in a rabble house with ISIS outside shooting when you go to bed tonight. Why were you born in America? Why were you born in the land of the free that had Christian values all around you? Why are you in a church tonight? Why are you listening to me? Why are you loving Christ? Because you are God's plan A to reach the world. He has no plan B. You're it. Go ye into all the world. Now, think about what he's doing. All the world is coming to us. They're coming to us. Will there be problems? You bet. But you don't have to have Muslim extremists to come into America to have problems. Come on, somebody say amen. Yeah, have them anyway. Now, that may not be good that they're coming in. May, I do believe we should vet them. But on the same hand, understand, this may be our greatest opportunity to reach people. The church needs to get their head on straight. Instead of thinking of just the producers as people who bring money in and building, building more buildings and saying how great they are and how big they are, the church needs to have a revolution. We need to get to a point of saying, we are here to help people. One of the reasons why I love this church, let me tell you this, is because they're about people. They're about loving them. They're about reaching them. I will always associate with a church that's about loving and reaching people. And tonight, you know what? I think you are too. Would you bow your heads with me tonight for a moment? Let me ask a question. My last mo moment of feedback. How many of you got something out of tonight? Amen. How many know that you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood? How many know that the favor of God is on your life? And how many of you know that none of us deserve that? But he understands what he's doing. He knows who he's called. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you, Lord God, for salvation that's so full and free. I thank you, Lord God, that we don't wear your, your word on our heads, Lord, we wear it in our hearts. I'm thankful tonight, Lord God, that you've given us an ability to reach people in love. Lord, help us in the difficult things that are happening in America, the difficult decisions. Let us not look at our emotions, Lord God. Let us not look at the news media and get angry at every group of people that we see, Lord God. But let us look at people groups as people that you want to reach. Lord, even though the, those Christians that made them so, so amazing in the second century, the third century, is that their Roman persecutors put them in, in, in the arenas and, they, and animals ate them, Lord God, and they stood there with their arms open praising you. I thank you, Lord God, for something that transforms us. Bless this, these people that are here tonight, Lord God. Bless our coming in and our going out, our rising up, our lying down, Lord God. Let us realize that we are the head and not the tail. And Lord, let us speak this word of truth to someone who doesn't know it, even of another faith. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand tonight.